science news lately has been exploding with bold headlines on the James Webb Space Telescope, what we'll call the JWST in this episode. These headlines promise that JWST has found galaxies that shouldn't exist, and that this discovery has broken physicists' understanding of the early universe. So how much of this is all just hype, and how excited should we really get? To help us answer these questions, today we'll get an inside scoop on this latest discovery from a very special guest who is an expert on galaxy formation in the early universe. This episode of Why This Universe is supported by Wondrium. Wondrium offers thousands of video and audio courses on a huge range of topics. I've been listening to Wondrium for years, and I've enjoyed courses from them on topics from philosophy and history to literature, math, and science. One of my favorite courses in Wonder Room right now is called Modern Political Tradition, Hobbes to Habermas. This series of lectures covers the philosophical foundations of government and society, including the social contract, the rights of individuals, and the ethical basis for things like law and punishment. So if you want to know more about political philosophy, or just about anything else, check out Wonder Room and give them a try. You can sign up for Wonder Room right now through our special URL and get a free month of unlimited access. Uh, just go to wondrium.com slash universe. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot C-O-M slash U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. I'm Shalma Wegsman. And I'm Dan Hooper. If you've been following the science news lately, you may have heard that the James Webb Space Telescope, what we call the JWST, has observed some very old galaxies, roughly a half a billion years or so after the Big Bang. It's not exactly surprising that galaxies that old exist, but these galaxies seem to be a lot bigger than anyone had expected, and they seem to contain some surprisingly old stars. Stars that probably just shouldn't be there. It's a really surprising and frankly confusing situation. To help us make some sense of these observations and what they might mean for cosmology, we have a special guest on this episode of Why This Universe. Michael Boylan Colchin is an associate professor in the Department of Astronomy at the University of Texas in Austin. He's a cosmologist who's an expert on the process of galaxy formation and on the ways that we can study galaxies to learn more about the nature of dark matter. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So just to get off the ground here, before we get into these new observations and everything, let's start with a you know short story of what cosmologists expected to see when they looked at these first hundreds of millions or billion years after the Big Bang. Sure. So cosmologists have a very successful model that's based on the understanding that the universe is dominated today by dark energy and dark matter, and atomic matter is a mere 5% of the energy density. And this is based on observations of the afterglow of the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background. And what we observe in the cosmic microwave background is that the variation from place to place in the universe uh, in terms of mass density is very small. So we understand that um, the fluctuations, the difference from point to point was, was tiny in the early universe, maybe a part in 100,000 on average. And so structure has to grow from these initial seeds to the big things that we see today. And the way structure grows is through gravity, and that takes a little while. And, and also, we have a model that we can measure from the microwave background that tells us that the first things that form are the smallest collections of dark matter and regular matter. So what we expect is to see uh, the first things that would form would be the smallest kind of objects that can form galaxies, and forming bigger galaxies would take longer. Um, and so we would expect from this model, which again is extremely successful, that the first earliest galaxies would be sort of very small objects, and then the biggest ones would take some time to emerge. How, when do you think, when would, before these observations, when would you have guessed that the first galaxies, the roughly the size of the Milky Way, would have been formed? Yeah, um, so I think that we would have expected probably that you know, maybe there's one in the entire universe at, at some early time. But if we really want to think when could they become sort of reasonably common, I think we would have said, okay, maybe um, a billion years after the Big Bang would have been about the earliest we'd expect this. And really, we'd want to wait a little bit even longer, probably 
1.5 or even 2 billion years before they came very common. Okay, so Milky Way-like galaxies start to become pretty common in the universe one or two billion years after the Big Bang in the standard picture. I think that would that'd be a reasonable approximation. Good. Yeah. Good. So now let's compare that with what JWST has recently reported to observe. Yes. So this set of observations says that really it's possible to get these very massive galaxies at very early times. So as you mentioned, maybe five six, seven hundred million years after the Big Bang. And, you know, 500 million years sounds like a lot to us, but in terms of the evolution of the universe, it's not very much time. And it really has to grow to a lot of, of total stellar mass. So we're talking maybe 100 billion times the mass of the sun in stars, and that's a lot of stars that would have to form. So this is like growing those galaxies in roughly like half as much time as, you know, you'd expected based on the standard cosmological model. And that that's right. And cosmologists don't really use time as much as we use how much the universe has expanded. And so, you know, it's the universe has really expanded a fair bit in, in that period. It's a, it's a substantial amount of uh, the lifetime of the universe at that point. Since the universe is so young, we're talking about, yeah, sort of double the age of the universe, as you're mentioning. Right, right. So, yeah, just to fill in on that, like uh, we like to think of, of things in time, but when when cosmologists are talking about the chronology events, we use this thing called redshift, which like tra you know maps with time. Bigger redshifts are earlier in time, but that's the way we like to keep track of things. So maybe just for um, our audience who might not know a lot of the details, uh, can you say a little bit about? this telescope itself, the JWST telescope, what it's like and, you know, how it does these observations, what it's actually seeing? Sure, that's a great question. Um, you know, the telescope is often billed as a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, but in a sense, it's a little bit different. It's really a complement to the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope looks at, at wavelengths of light that we can see with our eyes, so the optical wavelengths. It also looks a little bit at shorter wavelengths, so higher energy light, the ultraviolet, and a little bit at um, longer wavelengths, so lower energy light in the infrared. The James Webb Space Telescope is really optimized to look in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And what that means is it's seeing lower energy light. Now, we just went and, and talked briefly about this idea of redshift, about how the universe is expanding. Uh, and that's one of the ways we measure how it's expanding. What happens with this expansion of the universe is that light emitted at early times gets stretched out as the universe expands. And as it gets stretched, it goes to longer and longer wavelengths. So the universe expanding stretches wavelengths of light as well. So what that means is um, we expect that light from star forming galaxies is typically dominated by the most massive hottest stars which emit their light in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum but that means that um, as the universe expands that light gets shifted red shifted into longer and longer wavelengths and so no longer is visible at ultraviolet wavelengths or even optical wavelengths anymore if it's from the earliest parts of the universe it's now visible in the infrared and so that's exactly what James Webb is meant to do. It's taking light that was emitted from these young stars, these hot, massive young stars in the early universe, and it's capturing them as it's been expanded out into this infrared part of the spectrum. Great. So let's go back to those galaxies, those early galaxies that we were talking about. Other than how big they seem to be and how old they seem to be, do these look like the same galaxies we see everywhere else in our universe, or do they have any other features that are surprising? I think everything about them has been pretty surprising. These just look like faint fuzzy dots in imaging from JWST, and that means that they're very compact, so maybe uh, up to 10 times smaller than the Milky Way would be today. And whereas the Milky Way we see today has sort of this thin disk of stars that's rotating regularly, we don't know exactly about these galaxies, but it doesn't seem like that would be what these are. These would be very different kind of systems. It would be much more irregular and dominated by this very compact clump. The other aspect of these galaxies is they likely have very massive black holes, at least some fraction of them. And um, that's an important aspect of understanding how galaxies and their black holes can grow together. 
So speaking of those black holes, one thing I've, I've been thinking a lot about lately is the surprising fact that there seem to be so many really enormous black holes at really high redshifts at really early times. Do you think that that problem could be related to this these early galaxies that JWST is observing? I think that's a really exciting possibility that we're seeing more massive black holes at early times, we're seeing more massive galaxies at early times, really things are more evolved. Um, and the other aspect of that is that if these galaxies host very massive black holes, all of them, then we may need to reevaluate exactly how massive they are, because some of their light might be coming mm. from accretion onto these massive black holes, which is the way they grow. So matter falling in gets very hot, it emits light that could be mistaken for starlight if we didn't really model that correctly. And so we're still in the early days of figuring out exactly what's going on with these galaxies. So when when we use this telescope to measure the mass or the size of a galaxy or something, what we're really doing is measuring a total amount of starlight, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, we're not even really measuring a total amount of starlight. We're measuring an amount of light in a certain part of the spectrum that is now visible to JWST. And so um, these the the results from this paper are all based on just taking pictures of these galaxies, what we call imaging. Right. Um, but there is also the possibility to take those images and split it up among its component wavelengths. So really understand what contribution is coming from each range of JWST's observational capabilities. That would be spectroscopy, which would require pointing JWST with a different instrument. Uh, but that would really tell us a lot more about these systems. It would really tell us in detail about the starlight and probably about the contribution from these massive black holes as well. I assume that there are plans to do that, um, given how much interest this result has generated. Yes, absolutely. So I think a lot of times people say, well, heck, let's, why didn't they just do that in the first place? <laughs> uh, and of course, that would have been very nice. But what you have to do, have to do is know where to look. Uh, and so what they're really doing initially is just taking pictures over the full field of view of, of JWST, which is actually quite small. And then if you find something interesting, you can go back and point it again and use a different instrument to do these spectra. And that's, there are certainly plans for that, but that has to go through proposal phases, be accepted, and then uh, decided to the, at the highest levels that people look at this. And I'm sure that these are ones that people are absolutely going to be looking at in more detail. And just to clarify, I don't think we've said this, but I think it's, it's six of these early galaxies we're talking about, right? So the, the six is a small enough number that they can do this zoom-in observation of all six, I suspect. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, one of these has already been looked at in detail and has been found to have one of these massive black holes at early times. So one out of the six is already known to be uh, harboring a very massive black hole. Now, as you said, there's six of these, and that's not that many, but again, it's in a very small area, so that's part of the surprising aspect here. It's not like JWST has looked at the entire sky and found a unicorn. It's, it's looked at a tiny portion of the sky and found five or six unicorns, right. and now we start to think the unicorns might be out there. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. All right, so, um, all right, so let's pivot now to what the big picture of all this might mean. So there are a lot of ways that this could play out. Um, so what's the most mundane resolution to this problem you can think of? What, what's the, uh, answer to this puzzle that we could discover over the next weeks, months, and years that would be, you know, the most boring vanilla explanation? Okay. So I think there are a series of these. Uh, the first is the laziest one from the point of view of a theorist is to blame the observers. Just say you didn't do your observations, right? <laughs> and I think... Um, well, that's sort of a, a snide way of saying in, in early days, they didn't really understand the properties of the instrument in, in great detail. And so it needed to be calibrated. Uh, and, and so there was a slight change in the calibration, but we don't think that's the issue at this point. So that would have been an easy out that the instrument wasn't quite well understood. But I don't think that's, that's correct anymore as the explanation. As a theorist, I feel compelled to say, I love my observer friends. I think they do great work. If there's a mistake, it's probably on my back, not on theirs, you know, observers. Some of the greatest people, yes. Some of the greatest people. Some of my best friends are observers. All right, yeah. all right. Um, 
Absolutely. So I, I agree. Um, and also, I live in an apartment with many of the greatest observers. So I do not want to uh, get on anybody's <laughs> bad side here as well. So um, the next possibility then is that, again, what we're measuring is the light from the galaxy. And what we want to know is the total amount of stellar mass. And so that requires some underlying models to go from the light to the stellar mass. And one of the things that you need to know there is exactly how the stars have formed over history. The other thing you need to know is exactly how massive a typical star is as it's forming. This is something that astronomers call the stellar initial mass function, so the distribution of masses, uh, of how many stars there are at any given mass. And again, this is because the light is dominated by the most massive stars, but the mass is typically dominated by the least massive stars. There are many, many more low mass stars than there are high mass stars. And so if this is um, not quite done correctly, if one assumes a certain stellar initial mass function and it's really a different one in this galaxy, that could lead to some uh, discrepancy. And I think the other issue we touched on is whether there are substantial contributions from accreting black holes in these early galaxies. Now, I will say that all of these aspects would be still interesting to astronomers, very sure. interesting, because we expect that stellar initial mass function to be roughly the same everywhere in the universe. There are models why it could vary, but we never really see strong variations. So maybe this would be telling us things are going on very differently in the early universe than we were expecting in terms of how stars form. Or if the black holes are really there and, and going gangbusters in the early universe, that's really exciting too and telling us something new. Um, so those would be, I think, the, the simplest explanations there. All right. So let's turn it on its head and ask the opposite question. What is, you know, the most exciting possible resolution from a, you know, fundamental physics perspective that, that might ultimately be rearing its head here? Well, from a fundamental physics perspective, um, if these results are actually all correct, there really is kind of a serious problem. Um, that is, if it's not some of the light is coming from black holes and the, the way stars are forming in the early universe, at least in terms of their distribution over masses, is about the same as it is today. We do have a problem because we know how, how much dark matter there is in a, in a given uh, collapsed object, in a given halo, and that gives you the upper limit to how much atomic matter there can be. And for some of these galaxies, we actually see that there is more stars than there is atomic matter to form those stars in the galaxies, which is always a problem. Uh, if you find something that's above an upper limit, that's an issue. So this could tell us that really something needs to be a little bit different in how structure is forming in the early universe. And there's very little wiggle room in our standard dark matter plus dark energy cosmology to do that. So we might need to um, see if there's something else that we're missing about this cosmology in that case. So here's a question or a variation of a question I like to ask people uh, when these sorts of situations come up. Say I'm your good friend and I'm a odds maker at Vegas and I want to create a, a betting pool on how likely it is that these observations will be resolved by new fundamental physics. Okay, not just, you know, variations of the astronomical processes, but like new laws of physics, new forms of matter and energy, whatever, that we currently don't know about. And to make money on this, this betting pool, I need to estimate the odds reasonably accurately. And I call you, Mike, my expert friend who's going to tell me what the odds should be for me to make the most possible money. What, 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 what's your honest answer for how likely it is that fundamental physics are respons is responsible for this? Well, I should start out with saying nobody should be relying on me for making money, but uh, I appreciate the, the confidence, so I'll try to give my best. We're going to get rich here. together, Mike. It's going to be great. Excellent. This, is, this has been long been my dream of getting rich based on uh, physics betting pools. So <laughs> I think that if it were only these early galaxies, I would say less than 1% odds that it would require a new fundamental physics. There's just so much we don't know about how star formation proceeds in the early universe. We haven't taken spectra of these galaxies for the most part, and so we don't know what we don't know about them. The interesting aspect, though, of the fundamental physics changes that we need to get these kind of galaxies, if it really is a change in fundamental physics, is that we need more and faster formation of structure at early times. And that's actually 
the same kind of resolution that one would need to explain the Hubble tension, which I think you've talked about in a previous episode. We have, like just yeah. a, a discrepancy between measurements of how fast the universe is expanding based on whether you measure very locally with galaxies or you infer this expansion rate from the cosmic microwave background. And this goes in the same direction. The requirements to sort of make those two agree by changing cosmology goes in the same direction as something that would resolve these early massive galaxies if they truly are a problem. So now I'm maybe moved from less than 1% to something on the order of, of 10%. So okay. I wouldn't think it's the most likely scenario, but I also wouldn't say, hey, you know, don't uh, bet on it at all. Yeah, 10% isn't that small. Um, that's right. Yeah, that's something yeah. I would keep my eye on. Okay, exciting. All right, so Mike, before we let you go, um, can you give us an idea of like how this is going to play out, how long it might take, and what's going to change that will help us clarify the situation, understand it better? Absolutely. So I think one of the really exciting aspects about this is that we really should know a lot better in the next year to two years about whether this is a serious problem for a cosmology, whether it tells us something more about the star formation in the early universe, or whether it's something totally different. And the reason for that is there's a tremendous amount of JWST data that's already been taken. There are surveys now that are going over different parts of the sky. So if these galaxies are actually truly common, we should find a lot more of them. If it just so happens we looked at a very rare patch of the sky and found these, these six massive galaxies, then we'd be able to figure that out pretty quickly. And so there are both very deep surveys over small areas of the sky, so looking for very faint objects. And then there are surveys over much wider areas that are looking for more of these as well. And surveys over wider areas should really tell us whether these galaxies are common. And then I think the other aspect is this spectroscopy. There's lots of different teams that are looking to understand the real distribution of this light to, to interpret these galaxies in great detail, these galaxies and any others that are like them. And there are actually results coming out every week on uh, in physics journals, astronomy journals that are increasing our knowledge of this area. So it's a really exciting time because we are getting answers on a short time scale. Great. Thanks for your time, Mike. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It was fun. A huge thank you to Mike boylan Colchin for coming on today. If you want to learn more about JWST and what other sorts of discoveries astronomers are expecting to get out of it, check out episode 40 of our show. Why This Universe is brought to you by the University of Chicago Podcast Network. It's edited and produced by me, Shalma Wegsman, and my co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. If you like our show and you want to support us even more, you can find us on Patreon. There you can access ad-free episodes of the show, as well as exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes where you get to ask Dan and I direct questions about physics or anything else. So if you are curious about that, you can find it at patreon.com slash whythisuniverse. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. <laughs>